Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing cholesterol metabolism. Okay, so, um, the picture has changed a little bit from the previous uh, video, and that's because I started making uh, the next video, and then because of unforeseen circumstances I had to stop making it, okay? And now I'm going to re-go through this bit in this video, okay? So, a few little bits have been added on to this picture, so we've got a cholesterol crystal shown here, and we've also got growth factors being released by the macrophage here. Okay. So let me just go through where we got to, and then I'll add these bits into the picture. Okay, right. Uh, so we are discussing the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis, how you can form atherosclerotic plaques uh, in the walls of arteries, basically. Okay, and we've discussed that it, it's believed to be triggered initially by some sort of damage to the endothelial cells here, which makes these endothelial cells misbehave big time. Okay, and they start... Uh, recruiting in uh, macrophages from monocytes in the blood, which are the precursors to macrophages. Okay, so they bring macrophages into the subendothelial space. So if I bring back our picture of the artery wall, they're bringing macrophages into this orange area here. Okay, they also start letting LDL particles cross into the subendothelial space. So now, what's going to happen is underneath these misbehaving endothelial cells, you're going to get macrophages invading and LDL particles coming in. Okay, now, macrophages believe that there is something horrendous in the subendothelial space, some horrible pathogen that needs to be uh, found and destroyed. Okay, so they start um, releasing horrible molecules such as superoxide, okay, which is a free radical, and we discussed that superoxide can react with components of the LDL particle and change it into this new type of LDL called oxidized LDL, which we don't really understand that well. We don't really know what's different between oxidized LDL and LDL. The definition really of oxidized LDL is just LDL that has reacted with superoxide and other uh, horrible free radicals that macrophages can release. Okay, right. Uh, now, the key thing to understand here, then, is that oxidized LDL is perceived as a terrible threat by these macrophages here. Okay, so they start endocytosing the oxidized LDL up with this scavenger receptor that's on their surface. Okay, and they start accumulating all of the cholesterol uh, esters uh, from that uh, oxidized LDL particle in huge stores that become... That begin to dominate uh, their cytoplasm, okay, and they are then being transformed into foam cells. Okay, right, uh, so in the subendothelial space then we are getting more and more foam cells being formed by this process. Okay, it goes on and on and on and we'll get more and more foam cells being produced because we continue to bring in more macrophages and more LDL. And of course, the process will go much, much quicker if you've got a very high level of LDL within your blood. So if you're hypercholesterolemic, this process will occur much faster, basically, and you'll build up uh, a stack of foam cells in your subendothelial space much quicker, basically. Okay, now, so that's where we had got up to in the previous video. Now what I need to tell you is also, foam cells can die. Okay, uh, they can give up on life basically, and when they die, uh, they release this huge store of cholesterol that they had within them just into the uh, subendothelial space basically, into the extracellular fluid. Okay, and this can start to form cholesterol crystals in the subendothelial space. So that's what this is representing it's representing a cholesterol crystal in the subendothelial space. Okay, so. Basically, so far, what we have seen then is we will now be getting a huge stack of foam cells and cholesterol crystals being formed in this subendothelial space, and that's going to start causing a bulge here that will project into the lumen and obstruct the lumen, which I'll draw in the next picture. Okay, but the bulge of foam cells and cholesterol crystals in the subendothelial space is not the only component of an atherosclerotic plaque. Okay, what happens is when you form an atherosclerotic plaque, you end up getting something called a fibrous cap over the top. Okay, and I think I'll actually draw this before I explain where it comes from. So I'll just get a new piece of paper and draw what an atherosclerotic plaque is actually going to look like. 
Okay, right. So we're now going to have this bulge outwards into the lumen of the blood vessel. Okay, so here we go. And we'll have the endothelial cells on top still here. And these are these misbehaving endothelial cells. Okay, that have been damaged in some way to cause them to misbehave so much. And I'll just give them nuclei here. And of course, these endothelial cells will still have a basement membrane that they're sitting on. So I'll put in the basement membrane next. Okay, so here is the basement membrane. And then underneath the basement membrane, we know that there is the subendothelial space. And this is where we've now started to form this atherosclerotic plaque. Okay, now a big portion of the atherosclerotic plaque is going to be made up by foam cells. Okay, and that's this sort of portion here. Foam cells and cholesterol crystals, basically. And I'll just colour this portion in, in yellow. So this is a huge mass of loads and loads of foam cells, basically. Okay, these macrophages that have come into the subendothelial space and taken up loads of the oxidised LDL. Okay, and you'll also have these cholesterol crystals dotted around, which are where foam cells have died and released all of their cholesterol that's stored within them into the extracellular uh, space. Okay, so uh, this is what's known as the lipid core of the atherosclerotic plaque. So this is the lipid core. However, you'll see I've left this space here, and that's because there's another structure there, which is going to be called the fibrous cap, and we haven't yet seen where this comes from. Okay, so now let me explain what the fibrous cap is going to be and where it's going to come from. So going back to this picture, okay, these macrophages that have invaded into the subendothelial space, they start releasing other molecules besides just superoxide. And they're also going to release these growth factors here, loads of growth factors. So things like transforming growth factor beta, plate that derive growth factor, we will abbreviate them all down to just being called growth factors because they're all going to do the same thing. Okay, so these macrophages are releasing these very powerful molecules called growth factors. Okay, and what's going to happen is these growth factors are going to diffuse back from the subendothelial space, which is where the macrophages are, to where the smooth muscle cells are in the Chinica media here. Okay, and it's going to cause a lot of change in the behavior of these vascular smooth muscle cells. Okay, so the vascular smooth muscle cells are going to respond to these growth factors coming to them, and they're going to completely change their behavior. They're going to stop being contractile cells that are immobile. Okay, and they're going to start becoming mobile. They're going to move towards the source of the growth factors. So they're going to move into the subendothelial space here. Okay, uh, and they're going to start proliferating, which is something that they don't do that much as vascular smooth muscle cells, and they're also going to start chucking out connective tissues, so they become far more like fibroblasts than smooth muscle cells anymore, okay? Uh, so, what these are the things which form the fibrous cap, basically. They're going to come in to this portion here, so I'll draw some of these smooth muscle cells that have migrated in here. They're going to start proliferating, Okay, to make lots of smooth muscle cells. Okay, and they're also going to start chucking out loads of connective tissue, and they're going to make a tough connective tissue layer, basically, that covers the lipid core of the atherosclerotic plaque. Okay, and uh, this is just underneath the basement membrane in the subendothelial space. Okay, and that's what produces this fibrous cap of the atherosclerotic plaque. These uh, vascular smooth muscle cells that migrated to, into the subendothelial space towards the source of these growth factors and have now started to proliferate and shuck out connective tissue. Okay, so those are the two major components of an atherosclerotic plaque. The lipid core protected by the fibrous cap. Okay, right. Uh, so, this is what happens in atherosclerosis. You get these things being produced within your arteries. Now, how can this lead to disease? Okay, well, it can lead to heart attacks and strokes, the two key examples of cardiovascular disease. Okay, now, why can it lead to heart attacks and strokes? Well, the main way that atherosclerotic plaques tend to precipitate heart attacks and strokes is through rupturing. Okay, so if I just show one of these here, 
So let's draw a blood vessel here, now from the side. Okay, so here is one side of the blood vessel. And now let's say we've got a atherosclerotic plaque here. Now, of course, it will be obstructing the blood flow through that artery, but usually the way that heart attacks and strokes are suddenly precipitated by atherosclerotic plaques is through the rupture of the atherosclerotic plaque. Okay, right. So basically, you can get atherosclerotic plaques occurring in the coronary arteries, which are the arteries which supply your heart muscle with blood. Okay, you can also uh, get it occurring in arteries which supply blood to areas of the brain. Okay, so I'll just call those uh, brain arteries. Okay, now. Uh, this will be gradually obstructing the blood flow through those areas, but it isn't usually the obstruction of blood flow that actually, um, well, the obstruction of blood flow from the plaque itself that actually precipitates the sudden heart attack or the sudden stroke. Okay, usually what ends up happening is the atherosclerotic plaque ends up rupturing. A portion of it will tear off. Okay, so let's say this portion gets torn off. Okay, and then what ends up happening is you start getting uh, a blood clot formed on top of this exposed surface, basically. Okay, uh, so what you'll end up having is a plate that plug formed and loads of fibrin holding it all together. Okay, and because this clot is forming actually in a blood vessel, it's not called a hemostatic plug, which is when it occurs, when it should occur, okay, but instead it's called a thrombus. Okay, so when you get at the hemostasis mechanisms coming into play in an intact blood vessel, uh, that's called thrombosis, okay, and that's a pathological blood clot. Okay, and the actual pathological blood clot itself is called a thrombus. So basically, on top of this ruptured surface here, you can get this uh, thrombus forming, which is going to be made up of loads and loads of platelets all tied together by a fibrin meshwork, basically. Okay, and now that can suddenly obstruct this blood flow where this atherosclerotic plaque was. Okay, and uh, now if that's in the coronary arteries or some cerebral artery, uh, what that's going to cause is whichever area of the heart or brain that those arteries were supplying is now going to uh, no longer be getting any blood, okay? And uh, that can cause the tissue uh, which was being supplied uh, by these arteries to become ischemic, okay? And then it can start to die because of lack of oxygen and lack of glucose. And when tissue starts to die because of lack of oxygen and lack of glucose uh, due to lack of blood supply, it's called infarction, okay? So the fancy word for a heart attack then is a myocardial meaning pertaining to the myocardium, the muscle of the heart, infarction, meaning death due to lack of uh, blood supply. Okay, so in the heart, you can get large portions of the heart dying uh, because of lack of blood supply. That's called myocardial infarction or a heart attack. In the brain, uh, it's often referred to as a stroke, but the fancy uh, terminology for a stroke is a cerebrovascular accident, a CVA for short. So this stands for cerebro, okay, meaning pertaining to the brain, vascular, meaning pertaining to the vascular system, and then accident. Okay, right, so that's the more fancy terminology for a stroke. Right, so again, that's portions of the brain dying because of uh, lack of blood supply, basically. Okay, right, so that's how atherosclerosis then can lead to heart attacks and strokes. It's usually because the atherosclerotic plaque ends up rupturing and then you get a thrombus formed on top of that, which then completely obstructs uh, the blood flow through that artery. Okay, rather than it being a gradual process of the atherosclerotic plaque growing so big that it ends up obstructing the entire artery. Of course, that can happen, but usually the reason that you get a sudden precipitation of a heart attack or stroke is uh, because the atherosclerotic plaque ruptures and then forms a thrombus on top of it. 
Okay, right. Uh, so what we now want to turn our attention on to is uh, the anti-atherosclerotic drugs. So drugs that can help to prevent this happening. Okay, and many of these concentrate on trying to lower your blood LDL level. Okay, trying to tackle the hypercholesterolemia. Okay, because if you lower blood LDL level, then the rate at which atherosclerosis occurs will be hugely reduced, basically. Okay, so we're now going to uh, take on the topic then of anti-atherosclerotic drugs. Okay, right, so I've only got four examples of anti-atherosclerotic drug classes to talk about, which are the statins, the fibrates, uh, then azitinide, uh, sorry, azitinibe, uh, and then uh, finally drugs which prevent uh, bile salt reabsorption. Okay, right, so anti-atherosclerotic drugs. So we will start off with the statins because they are the most commonly prescribed ones. Okay, so statins then. So first thing, let me give you some examples then of statins. So all the statins, you can tell when a drug is a statin because it has at it, the end of its name uh, the suffix statin. So examples of statins then are simvastatin, lovastatin, and atorvastatin. And amongst these drugs are some of the greatest selling drugs of all time. Okay, so they are very, very uh, important drugs in medicine. Okay, so simvastatin, lovastatin, and atorvastatin. Okay, now they all work in the same way. Okay, they are all obviously have different chemical structures, okay, but they do all work in the same way. And the way they work is by blocking the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme. Okay, so they're going to inhibit that key enzyme in the uh, biosynthesis of cholesterol, basically. Okay, HMG-CoA reductase, which, remember, catalyze the conversion of HMG-CoA, beta-hydroxy-beta-methylglutaryl-CoA, into mevalonate. Okay, and that step was the rate-limiting step in the biosynthesis of cholesterol. So the rate at which that reaction went was the rate at which the entire uh, biosynthesis of cholesterol went, basically. It determined how much cholesterol you actually produced. Okay, so these statin drugs, simvastatin, lovastatin, atorvastatin, they're going to work by inhibiting that enzyme, which means now that uh, liver cells and peripheral cells all over the body are going to be capable of synthesizing much less cholesterol. Okay, so their synthesis of cholesterol is going to go down. Okay, that means now that if a cell needs some more cholesterol, okay, it is going to have to take more of that from the LDL pool rather than from uh, biosynthesis roots. Okay, so remember, if a cell uh, had too little cholesterol, what was its response? Its response was to turn on biosynthesis of cholesterol and also to start absorbing it from uh, the LDL pool within the blood. Okay, now we're saying we're going to reduce the amount it can synthesize, so consequently it will have to take more out of the LDL pool. So that is going to help reduce LDL level, basically. Okay, so LDL level within the blood is going to go down. So these drugs help to deal with hypercholesterolemia. They help to reduce uh, blood cholesterol level. Okay, and of course, if we lower LDL level then, uh, we will now uh, have slower progression of atherosclerosis because you'll have less LDL going into the subendothelial space and therefore the entire pathogenesis will occur more slowly if you've got lower LDL levels, which is how statins protect you from uh, atherosclerosis. Okay, right. The next class of drugs then that I want to talk about is the fibrates. So those were the statins. Next up, I want to talk about the fibrates. Okay, and these are kind of like second-line drugs. Okay, statins are the first-line drugs that are tend to be used. Okay, fibrates will be reserved for more severe uh, hypercholesterolemia, where you really are at high risk of getting uh, atherosclerosis. 
Okay, so uh, what examples then are there of fibrates? So some important examples of fibrate drugs, and I should say that with all of these classes of drugs, I'm just giving you examples. There are others as well. So there are many other statins beyond uh, these three that I've uh, talked about, and there are more fibrates than the ones that I'm just going to give you. Okay, but I'm giving you examples. So some important clinically used fibrates are phenofibrate and also gemfibrozil. Okay, so phenofibrate is one, and then gemfibrozil is another important uh, clinically used one. Okay, right. Now, these drugs work in a very different way uh, than the statins. The statins are all about reducing blood LDL level and therefore reducing the rate at which atherosclerosis is actually going to occur. The fibrates they actually have the ability, to some extent, to reverse atherosclerosis, okay? So to actually make the existing atherosclerotic plaque better. Statins, all they're going to do is stop it getting any worse, basically, or rather they're going to reduce the rate at which it gets worse. But fibrates can actually, to an extent, reverse uh, the atherosclerotic plaque. Okay, now how can they do this? Well, it's all about this reverse cholesterol transport process, this process whereby peripheral cells can give cholesterol to HDL particles. Okay, so remember, when a peripheral cell has too much cholesterol, what happens is it gets the liver X receptor activated by oxysterols, which are derivatives of cholesterol. That uh, then drives the increased expression of those two transporters, ABCA1 and ABC. G1, so I'll just bring the picture back up here, okay, so here are these two transporters that they put on their surface, and these will pump cholesterol out of the cell, where it can be accepted by HDL particles, basically, okay, and that's uh, reverse cholesterol transport. Okay, so, the idea is then, these macrophages that are taking in all of this cholesterol from oxidized LDL, surely they should be activating these pathways of reverse cholesterol transport and giving it to uh, HDL particles. Okay, well clearly they don't do it enough. Okay, so what if we could make those macrophages do it more? Okay, what if we could force the macrophages to give up more of this cholesterol that they are storing inside of them, which is leading to their conversion into these foam cells? What if we can make them give up more of that to the HDL particles, then we would stop the formation of foam cells, basically, or, or rather even get rid of some of the foam cells that we have in there, okay? And therefore, we would have a very powerful anti-atherosclerotic effect there. Okay, and that's what the fibrates, to an extent, are going to do. Okay, so the fibrates are agonists. That's another transcription factor, basically. Okay, so this is a new transcription factor that we haven't yet seen. Okay, so I'll just draw uh, a little piece of DNA here. So once again, these two parallel lines here, these represent a double-stranded piece of DNA here. Okay, and uh, basically, upstream of certain genes, there is going to be a uh, sequence of organic bases which combined a certain heterodimer of transcription factors. Okay, and one of the uh, members of this heterodimer is going to be the PPAR alpha, which is the agonist, or sorry, which is the molecule at which uh, phenofibrate and gemfibrosil, and more generally the fibrates, are agonists. Okay, so let me just introduce you to this PPAR alpha. Okay, right, so firstly, what does it actually stand for? So it stands for peroxisome, that's the first P, proliferator, that's the second P, and then activated receptor. Okay, so peroxisome proliferator activated receptor, and this is specifically the peroxisome proliferated activated uh, sorry, the peroxisome proliferator activated receptor alpha, okay, PPAR alpha. Okay, so PPAR alpha is another transcription factor that dimerizes with a second transcription factor. Okay, and that tr second transcription factor we have seen already, okay, it is again the um, retinoid X receptor. So, let me draw this on this diagram here. So, here is some gene. Okay, and certain genes will have a special uh, sequence in their gene control region here, 
which combines this heterodimer of these two proteins, PPAR alpha and the retinoid X receptor. Okay, so we'll say this one here, this is the retinoid X receptor here. Okay, and this one here, this is the proxisome proliferator activated receptor alpha, PPAR alpha. Okay, so I'll just colour these in. So I have PPAR alpha represented in red here. Okay, and then we'll have the retinoid X receptor uh, represented in vivid purple here. Okay, right. So this heterodimer of PPAR alpha and retinoid X receptor, it functions as a transcription factor. It combines to a special sequence of organic bases uh, that is present in the gene control region upstream of certain genes, and it can then affect the uh, transcription of these downstream genes. Okay, now, just like the liver X receptor and the retinoid X receptor dimer, the PPAR alpha combines molecules and change its activity. So this heterodimer here is usually attached to uh, its sequence of organic bases and it will be having one effect on the downstream gene, for instance repressing it, okay, uh, whereas once uh, agonists bind to PPAR alpha then the PPAR alpha retinoid X receptor heterodimer is going to change its function and it might then start activating the downstream gene. Okay, so it's going to change its function with respect to downstream genes when an agonist binds to the PPAR alpha. Now, the endogenous agonist of PPAR alpha, okay, is not very well understood. Okay, so we don't really know what in cells usually activates PPAR alpha. Okay, that's still very controversial as to what the important endogenous agonist for PPAR alpha is. However, we do now have exogenous agonists. Uh, these fibrate drugs, phenofibrate and gemfibrosil, and other examples of the fibrates. They are all agonists at PPAR alpha. They bind to PPAR alpha and activate it, okay, and then they change the function of these PPAR alpha retinoid X receptor heterodimers in the gene control regions upstream of genes, okay, and now uh, you're going to get changes in gene expression. So basically, when you take phenofibrate and genfibrozil, it's going to go into cells and it's going to change gene expression within cells. Specifically, we're hoping it's going to go into these macrophages and these foam cells within the atherosclerotic lesion, okay, and change their gene expression. Okay, now what genes are affected by these PPAR alpha retinoid X receptor heterodimers? Well, one of them is the liver X receptor genes. Okay, so the gene for liver X receptor alpha and the gene for liver X receptor beta. Now you'll remember when we talked about liver X receptors, I said that the liver X receptor alpha was mainly expressed in liver and liver X receptor beta was found in all tissues. Now it turns out that liver X receptor alpha is also found in macrophages, expressed in macrophages. So in these macrophages where we're hoping the uh, fibrate drugs are actually going to work, you're going to get liver X receptor alpha and liver X receptor beta increased in expression uh, by the act, uh, activation of PPAR alpha, basically. So PPAR alpha and retinoid X receptor heterodimers, they uh, affect the transcription of the retin oh, sorry, of the liver X receptor genes, basically, okay? And previously when the PPAR alpha had no agonist bound to it, okay, they were repressing the expression of these genes. Now, when they do have agonist bound to the PPAR alpha, the PPAR alpha retinoid X receptor heterodimer is going to increase the expression of these genes. Okay, so in these macrophages now, you're going to get more liver X receptor alpha and more liver X receptor beta being produced. And remember, those are the receptors for oxysterols. Okay, those are the ones which start the reverse cholesterol transport process. So if you have more of these receptors, okay, then the cell is going to be more sensitive to having too high cholesterol levels and the amount that it will be activating reverse cholesterol transport is going to go up. So the idea is that by activating the expression of liver X receptors, you're actually going to increase reverse cholesterol transport. Okay, so reverse cholesterol transport is going to be increased by increasing the expression of these liver X receptors. 
Okay, right. Uh, so that's how fibrates are believed to uh, help uh, heal atherosclerotic plaques by increasing the reverse cholesterol transport from these macrophages and from these foam cells, basically, uh, into HDL particles, and therefore helping to reduce the size of the uh, lipid core of the atherosclerotic lesion. Okay, right, now I just want to say uh, a little word of caution here, okay? So the fibrates are agonists at PPAR alpha. Okay, now those of you who are familiar with your anti-diabetic drugs will know that there is a class of anti-diabetic drugs that are agonists at PPAR receptors. Okay, but those are agonists at a different PPAR receptor. Okay, so uh, in anti-diabetic drugs there is a class of drugs known as the thiazolidine diones. Okay, thiazolidine Diones and uh, examples of thiazolidine diones are rosy glitazone, PO glitazone, they all end in the suffix glitazone. Okay, uh, and these are agonists at PPAR gamma rather than PPAR alpha, so don't confuse uh, the fibrates and the thiazolidine diones, it's a different PPAR receptor basically. PPAR gamma rather than PPAR alpha in the case of the thiazolidine diones. Okay, and the reason that they are useful in treating type 2 diabetes mellitus is that uh, they can change gene expression within skeletal muscle cells, within hepatocytes, and within um, adipocytes, and they have some way of reversing insulin resistance to some extent. Okay, so that's why uh, they are useful in diabetes, but be aware uh, that the fibrates are acting on a different PPAR receptor to the thiazolidine diones. Okay, right. Uh, so, next up I want to talk about azetonide, okay, which is a drug that can block the absorption of cholesterol from the diet. Okay, uh, so, azetonide then. Okay, so to understand the mechanism by which azetonide works, I need to tell you a little bit more about how cholesterol is actually absorbed uh, from uh, the lumen of the intestine into enterocytes. Okay, so let me just draw an enterocyte then here. Okay, so once again, here are the microvilli of our enterocyte here. Okay, and here is our basolateral surface of the enterocyte. So basically, uh, for cholesterol to be absorbed into the enterocytes, there is a special transporter for cholesterol, okay, known as the Neiman Pick C1 like one. So I'll put this little transporter here. Okay, so this is this transporter on the apical surface of the enterocyte, which is going to be transporting cholesterol molecules into the cell. Okay, and for short, this is abbreviated down to the NPC. 1L1, okay, 1L1. So this stands for Neiman Pick C1 like 1. Okay, so I'll write out its full name. Okay, so the N is for Neiman, okay, and the P is for Pick, okay, and it's Neiman Pick C1, and it's like 1, okay. So, this transporter is important for absorbing cholesterol from the intestinal lumen into the cytoplasm of the enterocyte. Okay, so if we could give a drug that blocks uh, the absorption of cholesterol uh, into the enterocytes by blocking this Neiman Pixie 1 like 1, then of course we could hugely reduce the amount of cholesterol that you're getting from your diet, okay, and therefore we would hugely reduce how much cholesterol was going into the LDL pool. Okay, if we s reduce how much you're getting in your diet, then obviously we'll reduce how much cholesterol is in your blood overall. Okay, uh, so uh, this is what the drug azetonide does. It blocks the Neiman Pixie one like one, and therefore uh, will reduce the amount of cholesterol that you are absorbing from your diet. Okay, and then uh, less cholesterol will be delivered to the hepatocytes. The hepatocytes will then be putting less cholesterol into the LDL pool through the endogenous pathway. Okay, and uh, therefore the LDL pool within the blood will go down. So again, this will reduce hypercholesterolemia and therefore you'll reduce the rate at which atherosclerosis occurs. Okay, now, uh, drugs that are on a similar theme to this, okay, which are drugs that work by 
stopping bile salts from being reabsorbed, basically. Okay, so now what I'm going to talk about is drugs which bind to bile salts. These target bile salts. Now, if you remember back to when we were talking about the enterohepatic circulation, okay, I'll just try and find the picture where we talk about the enterohepatic circulation. Here it is. Okay, so uh, the liver secretes bile salts into the duodenum. Okay, uh, which are important in emulsification, and then many of these bile salts are reabsorbed in the ileum. Okay, of course, not all of them will be reabsorbed, we'll lose a few uh, in the feces. Okay, and this is why we need cholesterol in our diet or, and also cholesterol synthesis because the liver always needs to be making more bile salts to replace the ones that are lost. Now, if we could give a drug that would stop the bile salts being reabsorbed here, then you'd get far fewer reabsorbed here, and therefore the amount of new bile salts that the liver would have to make would be hugely increased. So the liver would now need a lot more cholesterol. Now, of course, it could synthesize some of that cholesterol. It would get some cholesterol from the diet, but one of the places that it would probably now go for that cholesterol is the LDL pool. So it would start taking more cholesterol out of the LDL pool, okay, so that it can synthesize new bile salts, okay, so that would reduce the uh, LDL pool, basically. So, these next drugs, then, that I'm going to talk about work in exactly that way. They're going to target bile salts, they're going to stop the bile salts from being reabsorbed, okay, and therefore the liver is going to require more cholesterol for this increased synthesis of bile salts, and therefore it's going to remove cholesterol from uh, the LDL pool, hence lowering LDL levels. Okay, so let me give you some examples of drugs that work in this way. Okay, so one example is cholestyramine, okay, another example is cholestipol, okay, cholestyramine, then another example is cholestipol, okay, and finally, a final example is cholesevalan, okay, so cholesevalan, okay, and again, all of these Free drugs, cholestyramine, cholestipol, and cholesevalam, and they're all going to work by lowering blood LDL level and thereby achieving their anti-atherosclerotic effects, because if you lower LDL level, then the progression of atherosclerosis is hugely slowed down. Okay, and that's my final class of anti-atherosclerotic drugs that I want to discuss in this video. Okay, right, so that now concludes our discussion of cholesterol metabolism and the anti-atherosclerotic drugs.